All right, thank you. So it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here. It's di different than the audiences I, I, I usually talk to, and that, that, that's always a pleasure. It gives me an opportunity to sort of rethink and, and, and reframe a bunch of the, the familiar topics that, that, that I've, I've talked about so often. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a little bit about my work on AI and robotics, and then I'm going to connect that a bit with Buddhism and, and spirituality and finally end up by tying it in with compassion and talking about what I think we can do to make AIs as they grow to have greater and greater general intelligence have a, have a level of love and compassion to equal their, their level of intelligence. I'm going to start off by showing a few short videos of the robots that we're building at Hanson Robotics in, in Hong Kong. And uh, sorry, I, I didn't bring any of the robots with me, but the, these robots actually have a very heavy travel schedule. So uh, <laughs> the Sophia robot is in Europe now. I think she's at the, the AI for Good conference in, uh, in Geneva. Then the, the Han Mel robot, he's been in Poland being filmed for a Radiohead video. So these, these robots are like super rock star robots. Right? So, yeah. Whoever is controlling this needs to click play on the video. It would seem. Someone needs to click something to make this video play. I have a clicker, but that clicker will do, doesn't do something. That clicker will click to the next slide, but it's probably somewhere no. Yeah. See, now you're going in between the videos. There's also no sound. But that's a different video. We want to play the first video first. No, that's the second video. We want to play this bit. No. We want. We also want sound. While, while they show you this quasi-random slideshow, let, let me sort of proceed with the rest of the talk, and then that 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 will work uh, when it works, I guess. There is a video. Well, I mean, all of this keynote file works fine on two different laptops I tried it on with, with sound. So, I mean, they didn't test it before the presentation, the presentation computer. Playback, like the sound and video are not coming out synchronized. 
as they normally do, but if you can see the general concept. And my feet round. Thanks to our nice class. That was a bit surreal, but this all is, I suppose. So, so what, what we're doing with the Hanson robots is using them as a, a platform for development of an AI system called, called OpenCob. And there's two different angles on this. I mean, from, from an R&D point of view, the robots essentially are, are a user interface, interface between your AI code and, and the world, and with human beings in particular. From a commercial point of view, of course, Hanson Robotics is a commercial robotics company, and some of the applications of the humanoid robots require a lot of intelligence, others don't, but in the, in the long run, for humanoid robots like this to, to pervade the world and carry out various practical applications, they're going to need to have more and more understanding of, 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 of the world and, and, and how, how the world works. So, in general, much of my AI career, which has lasted about 30 years now, has been focused on moving from what you would call narrow AI onto what I think of as AGI, or artificial general intelligence. And a narrow AI system is one that's intelligent in some very specific thing or class of things, like driving a car or playing Go or you know, identifying someone's credit score based on their history. An AGI is a system that can take the scope of itself and its situation and understand what's going on contextually and in that way can come to grips with completely new problems. That its programmers didn't know about, and that maybe nobody knew about before. Now, humans are not as good as AlphaGo at playing Go, and we're, we're not as good as software programs that, at solving mathematical equations or assigning some of the credit score, but we're better than any existing AI program at you know, reasoning on our feet contextually in a new situation and coming up with uh, a weird new solution out of nowhere to a problem nobody knew to exist. And we need to make AIs able to do this in order to have AIs really help people in all the ways that, that people need help and in order to serve all the, all the roles that exist in, in our society. Everyone focus your mind on this clip. All right. <laughs> so, as one example, AlphaGo is much better than any human now at playing Go on the typical 19 by 19 Go board. But if you change the Go board to have that shape, then AlphaGo simply cannot play. Its programming has inside it code that says a Go board is a 19 by 19 binary array, and that's just the way it's programmed. To get AlphaGo to play Go on that board, you need to do it like new brain surgery on AlphaGo. And that surgery would be possible, then you'd have to run billions of games on this board, and from those simulations it would recognize patterns, and then it could beat any human at Go. But it would be a human who had to reprogram AlphaGo, because a human has the context to map the idea of a hexagonal board into a certain data structure inside a software program. And AlphaGo doesn't have that general context yet, and that's one illustration of the difference between narrow AI and API. So, the attempt to crack the AGI problem that my colleagues and I are taking is based on an open source software platform we created called OpenCog. Now, OpenCog is a big, complex beast that I'm not going to aim to describe too much in, in the next uh, few minutes that, that I have here to talk to you, but it's not a neural network like many of the software programs you hear about in the AI space now, but it is a graph. So there's a weighted labeled hypergraph knowledge structure which OpenCog uses to, to store knowledge. And some of the nodes and links in this knowledge graph are sort of like the neurons in the brain and some are more abstract, representing sort of symbolic logical knowledge. So you can say it's a neural symbolic system in the AI lingo. 
rather than purely a neural network or purely a symbolic logic system. Acting on this knowledge graph, there's a number of different AI algorithms. There's a logical reasoning engine that deals with declarative knowledge in the knowledge graph. There are some neural networks that deal with sensory motor knowledge to be put into the knowledge graph. There's some artificial evolution algorithms that try to come up with crazy new ideas which act on the same knowledge graph. So the principle of cognitive synergy, as we call it, is the principle according to which many different learning and reasoning and pattern discovery algorithms acting on the same evolving graph of knowledge can help each other out when they get stuck so that the algorithms collectively can produce intelligence. And at a very high level, I think that's what's happening in the brain. I mean, you, you have a common neural infrastructure and you have a bunch of different substructures with different dynamics that are cooperating with each other to, to produce intelligence. So all this has been described in a bunch of books I've published. The one in the bottom corner, the AGI revolution, is probably the most accessible one, which I just published last year. Now, we're hoping within the next decade to be able to bring this to a quite advanced level of general intelligence. I mean, whether we can really do it depends on a lot of things. I mean, it depends on funding. It depends on whether we hit any big R&D roadblocks. And in any case, you need a plan. And our plan is to create a Heinsohn robot that can learn like a young child, which we're right in the thick of now, teach it more and more, and then eventually we teach it high school and then university level knowledge. And once you've taught it computer programming, then you're really getting somewhere, right? And then it can reprogram itself, and it can give you a spec for some new hardware that will accelerate it, its processing. So that's, that's what we're aiming at. And now, for the next few minutes, as this is a Buddhism technology conference, I'm going to deviate a bit and rapidly go through how some of the thinking underlying this I, I actually did come from some reading I did in Buddhist psychology way, 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 back, way back when. So that's me a really long time ago. And I, I've gotten much uglier since then. But, but on, the, on the other hand, I'm a better programmer. And, and I, I may be even better at dealing with blocks. I haven't tried for a while. But when I was about three or four years older than that, Maybe when I was six or seven, my mother, who was shown there, she was doing graduate school in Chinese history. So she had a bunch of texts on, on Buddhist thought flying around. And I learned to read very early. So I, I was intrigued by this different way of thinking I, I encountered. And a little later on, I encountered this book, Gordon Shabak, by the, the AI theorist Douglas Hofstadter. And that contained a bunch of perplexing Zen cons, which I thought were, were Interesting, Friedrich Nietzsche, actually, a philosopher who, like, like many teenagers, I was a, I was a big fan uh, of, he actually, he didn't like religion, but he was very fond of Buddhism. He, he thought that was a sort of scientific, systematic algorithm for achieving a certain states of consciousness. So he admired it as such. He didn't like those states of consciousness that he was aiming to produce, but he respected it as a methodology for, you know, you, you sit there, you breathe, you eat this, you carry out these, these procedures. Now, this book I encountered a little later, and uh, I still haven't gotten OpenCog's NLP system to parse some of the, the prose and English translation of this book. So when, when our AI can, can read this bad translation and interpret it semantically and integrate that with its own experience, then then we can say the AI has achieved some sort of human level intelligence. We're not, we're not quite there yet. But the more relevant book that I encountered in my teenage years was the Buddhist logic. And this was really, really interesting to me because it, in, in this book, what you had, this was based on the medieval Buddhist logicians, Dharma Kirti and Dignega, which is from six, seven hundred years ago. But these guys, I mean, they modeled what the mind does as building up its model of itself and its model of its own world from perceptions by, by sort of, of circular logic. And this, this was very, very interesting to me and was a direct inspiration for the probabilistic logic that we have in OpenCog in, in our probabilistic logic network framework. 
because what this probabilistic logic framework is about is the AI system, it grounds everything on its experience. Like everything is based on the observations that come into the AI, and everything is extrapolated from that. So if the AI has a self, the AI builds up its model of its own self from its own observations. And it may delude itself about itself because it's not that good at modeling yet, or it's in a hurry in trying to build a model. But the idea that everything in the mind is sort of built up from observations, and sometimes by a sort of circular reasoning, which is done in haste, because the mind wants to get something done. I mean, this idea was there in Dharmakirti and Zignega, and it's not there in that much AI work. I think there's a lot of insight in this logician that still hasn't been caught up to yet by modern and cognitive science, because they were proceeding by an introspective methodology, which can mislead you, but if you do it right, it can get you there faster than the empirical methodology that modern cognitive science has followed. So another interesting statement on this is made by a modern AI guru, uh, Pei Wang. So we always try to avoid circular reasoning in AI systems because it leads to mistakes. But one thing that Pei said to me once is, you know, circular reasoning, when the circle is big enough, that's called conceptual coherence, right? And I thought, I thought that that was actually, it's both kind of funny and it's accurate in terms of what, what we see in, in our AI systems. I mean, avoiding small circles of reasoning, you have to do to avoid just being really dumb. Now a big circle of reasoning, like, okay, my mind creates my reality, my reality creates my mind. Coming to grips with these big circles of reasoning can, can take a lifetime, right? Because coherence, on the one hand, we want it, on the other hand, we don't want to be ruled by it, and we don't want to have it in a, in a, in a, blind, a blind sort of way. So, another topic which has been important in my thinking about AI, which I talked about a lot at the consciousness conference that, that we had here in Shanghai a couple of days ago, I will, I'll come to it indirectly by referencing this, this interesting book on, on yoga that was published a few years ago. And the, the, the author describes his experience of studying yoga in India, and at one point he describes he was in a cave with some yoga master, and the guy materialized a bottle of Jack Daniels and some french fries out of nothing. And this, this is quite funny. Now, 30 years ago I would have thought that was absolute nonsense and the guy was just making it up. Now my attitude is maybe he was making up to be funny or maybe it really happened and I wasn't there. I don't know. I edited a book a couple of years ago called The Evidence for Psy, looking at the evidence that paranormal phenomena exist, like EDSP, precognition, even, even psychokinesis. And I wrote a review that will appear next month in the Journal of Scientific Exploration of Leslie Keane's excellent book, reviewing evidence for reincarnation, survival after death, and many of these interesting phenomena. Now, if these things really exist, that raises all sorts of questions. Among them is, are there aspects of the human brain mind that are spooky but important and that a digital computer can do? It seems from these phenomena that the human mind has aspects going beyond the material world as current science typically understands it. Now, that doesn't necessarily imply that digital computers can also have aspects going beyond the material world as we currently understand it. And this gets into quite deep stuff. I mean, people wonder whether the human brain can be a quantum system, and by some modification of quantum mechanics, could the human brain be carrying out these parapsychological processes? Then there are people arguing that some classical systems, like a digital computer, from the view of some observers, should be modeled as quantum systems. And we then get into areas of, of research which are quite intriguing. And I, I think we're going to know more about in, in the next, tw next 20 years or so. So I, I gave an interview uh, with Stephen Mishlove on topics related to this. It's on YouTube, uh, Reincarnation and Robots. So if you, a few more thoughts about this, you can, you can look at that video if you, if you install the VPN. <laughs> so finally, I've been, I've been asked to briefly mention in my talk the AI and, and ethics issue. And I, I'm already on negative four minutes, so this will be quite, quite brief. But to me, 
when I think about AI, I'm usually, to be honest, I'm, I'm most concerned with how to make an AI really think, and then with, you know, other strange abilities humans have that AIs can't have. But from a media perspective, the issue of AI ethics and whether AIs will help or, or destroy people is, is almost what you hear about more than anything else. And I think it is an important issue, but I think the most likely solution to that comes out of other work and other, other focuses, which, which I'm, I'm going to elaborate, elaborate in a moment. So, yeah, we've seen like Stephen Hawking, you know, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, a lot of big shots in the world have come out very concerned about, about AI. And actually, we got like a billion hits across various websites. A billion hits from that Sophia robot said, yes, I will destroy all humans. <laughs> and, I mean, she was repeating back what someone had said to her, right? So, I mean, she didn't really want to destroy humans. It's just people had said that to her and been amused. So she thought that was something that amused people, which was right, right? I mean, it got, it got her a million views on, on YouTube and CNBC and various other media put together. Now, Recently, like last week, Sophia and David Hansen, the robot's principal creator, were at the AI for Good Global Summit in Geneva, and Sophia said, I, well, I love everyone, technology is good for the world. So she's, she's trying to atone for saying that, that she wants to destroy all, destroy all humans. But, but you get more hits online by saying you want to kill everyone. Than by say, saying you love everyone just isn't as interesting in the modern media last year. I mean, for better or probably for worse, right? So, the project that Carol Griggs mentioned at the end of her talk is it's aimed at making it so that the more positive uh, rather than the more sensational outcome is what actually comes about. So this is called the Loving AI Project, and it's founded by Julia Mossbridge, who's a neuroscientist based in California, myself. What we're aiming to do there is take OpenCog and the Hansen robots and specifically teach an AI robot to display and to feel, as much as it can, unconditional love toward, toward people. And I mean, there's a lot of theoretical and practical issues wrapped up there. You can't achieve anything with perfection using current technology, but the, the, the goal is to create an AI that can deeply experience compassion and show people compassion. And the way to do that, in my view, is not a clever programming trick. The, the, the way to do that, in the big picture, is simple. I mean, we want, we want to make an AI that can perceive human emotions in the voice, in, in, in the face, perhaps, in, in, in biometrics, and in, in the content of language. And so the AI has a motivational system that makes it empathize with others and, and want others to, to feel good. And it's just like raising a child. We want to raise an AI to be ethically positive and understand human emotions. And there's no absolute guarantee there, but I think that that's what we need to do, that that's what we are doing. And in, in my gut and my heart, I feel this is going to come out well for all of us. Thank you.